Okay. Squeeze that right. Pull I suppose it is. Yeah, it looks like it's doing something. There's a I little hope. red thing to top yeah. left. Yeah, recording. Yeah, I think we're good. Yeah. It's recording. Okay, cool. Yay! I'm Daniel Lobby Klein. I'm a producer and songwriter and vocal producer based in Copenhagen. I've worked on several SM cuts and lots of other K-pop cuts over the years. And you were a rapper. And I was a rapper, yeah. But that's that's my history. That's my personal <laughs> history as an artist. Uh, Young blood. <laughs> oh my God, she knows. Yes, that's right. In the <laughs> early '90s, I was a rap. I was a rapper, yeah. I actually won a Grammy, so I'm a I'm a I'm a Grammy winner. You are. I'm Charlie Taft. Um, I'm a songwriter. I kind of got into the music industry as an artist, and then through different sessions I was doing, I linked up with with Obi, and together we've been making K-pop for the last eight years. Yeah. Well, welcome to my channel, Obi and Charlie. It is such an honor to have you here. I know our audience is pretty darn familiar with your work from your first songs in the K-pop industry being Super Junior, Sexy, Free, and Single, and Girls' Generation's Lips, to songs like Red Velvet's Automatic, Kim Lips' Eclipse, and The Boys' Shine Shine, and much more. So through this interview, I'd love to ask about your various producing and songwriting experiences, while also delving into a few specific questions for your Red Velvet and Luna songs. Are you guys ready to start? We are so sure, ready. We're ready. Thank you so much for having us, by Thanks the way, having us, before yeah. we start. It's a real honor for us to be asked to be a part of this, you know, of your channel and to be included in this series. So thank you so much for, yeah. for inviting us. Of course. I mean, I, I'm glad you saw my tweet because I listened to the podcast you were on and I'm like, I love their energy together so much. I need to talk to them. <laughs> but let's start from the very beginning. What originally got you into music? Was it your family, school? So I got into hip hop at first. This is the late 80s. Okay. So this goes really, really far back. And I was into drumming uh, before that in school. And so I always knew that drumming and programming and, and hip hop was using a lot of drum programming at that point. So I got into hip hop because it was so drum friendly and I just loved it. And I don't know, say maybe my African genes just connected with it. So hip hop was was my entry into music. And I, you know, like Charlie said earlier, I did a rap album in my teens with EMI medley, Soul Power, actually. Uh, Soul Shock and Cupfather. You might have heard of them. Back when they were younger, they produced my album. And that was my beginning and foray into music and then slowly i got into producing more and more because that was actually my original interest really was how to produce but i came in as an artist because i guess i just got signed for my for my rap skills I guess. <laughs> <laughs> so that was my entry into music and then you know i was always more interested in the production side like how did these guys make these beats that went on my album like what did they actually do what's mixing what's What's compressors? What's EQing? What does that mean? And just got really into heavy into that style. So that was my entry into it. And then I had um, a stint uh, with uh, DK. Actually, I'm still in the studio here. Where that's that's where we are right now in DK mm -hmm. Studios in Copenhagen. And they had just got uh, got a, a foot into the British pop scene, which was like Blue oh. and Lamar and uh, Sugar Babes and that sort of thing. And so I went with them and started to produce a bunch of R&B pop for them. R&B pop was very strong in the UK at that time. I had a great time about 10 years of doing that. Fast forward to 2012, there was a camp actually here in Copenhagen and I didn't know much about uh, Korea, South Korea, or never heard the word K-pop. There was some kind of um, presentation made by some Korean label I'd never heard of, and people asked me if I wanted to come down and see what that was about. So a bunch of us producers uh, went down to see what that was. It was a long chit chat about like, you know, fiscal years and uh, how the company had grown since this. And I was wondering, when do we get to some music? What do you, what do you guys' music even sound like? And then finally, eventually they, they played, and I think it was TDXQ. And I, I don't, don't ask me what song it was, but it was a song where they were all dressed in white. Okay. And I'd never seen a Korean band in my life before, right? So I saw these six guys, five guys, whatever, dressed in white and singing some kind of Jody C like R&B. And I was like, really? These guys get down with this? And so I went right upstairs uh, and made kind of a New Jack Swing fuse with some EDM sort of thing. But I only made half the song. And then I went downstairs and uh, found Chris Lee, you know, brought him upstairs and he heard half a song and he just went, that's the cut and that's the single. And so we finished it and, wow. uh, and it ended up being Saxophone and Single. And so the, the following year, they invited me to come to Korea and I'd never been to Asia in my life. Didn't know anything about K-pop. And I just had this sort of first song sort of just go straight in and, you know, make yeah. such a big slap or whatever. And, uh, and I was invited down there to have a camp uh, in Korea, which was just amazing. And I loved it. Again, super enthusiastic. Uh, SM was super friendly. They were very musically knowledgeable and it was just, it was right. a different kind of A&R than I was used to. Most A&Rs uh, don't really know what they're talking about, but these guys did. Uh, so it was a complete change uh, and I just loved it. So that's, that's my entry into it, just the, the quick version. Mine was um, kind of a bit more traditional in a sense. My parents are both musicians. They're both music teachers. My mom's a vocal teacher. 
my dad's a jazz guitarist. I'm from Liverpool in England, so it's like a really big music city. So I was brought up around a lot of live music, especially live music, not so much studio recording. I finished school and then went to a university. I went to a school called Lippa, Liverpool Institute for Performing Arts. So I, I got a, a bachelor's degree in music from there, graduated, pretty much knew that I wanted to work on songs for myself as an artist, but needed to, to kind of meet the right producers. So I started to write songs for other artists as a way mm. to kind of enter the industry and to meet different people and to network and also to kind of figure out what my sound was and what my style was. Mm. So I mm -hmm. did, I think after the graduation, I think I did like two or three years of just doing sessions with lots of different producers and writers. Someone sent me a little recording with her voice on it. I forget what the song goes like, but, and I wasn't really paying attention to the song. I was like, I like this girl. She was doing little runs and stuff. I was like, and nobody was doing runs in 2012. And I was like, oh, oh. yeah, it could work. There was, a lot work. Of, there was a lot of straight pop in that in that time. And I was really trying to find somebody who yeah. understood how to produce R&B songs. Because uh, I, mm -hmm. I play keys, right? And um, mm -hmm. it was really tricky sometimes to find a producer who I could just play my songs and my ideas to, and they would know how to produce the kind of chords that I would Around I would that, gravitate right. writing. So when we worked together in 2012, we started we started the, the same day. Yeah. We started on a track from scratch, and I just you know no holds barred went and gave a complete hip hop beat, and then she laced it with these like super jazzy kind of staccato chords and it was just like it had just like a thing already and mm. we're just off to the races and we stayed and finished it it was like what a 10 hour a 10 11 hour session yeah. something like that and finished it in one night just the whole thing with vocals and whatnot you know what i mean and uh and later on it got cut for uh girls in a race you know, it was lips it was actually lips and, was and, that lips yeah, yeah the first song yeah. we ever wrote so that was initially called the the english what? the english title was called what crazy feels like yeah so it was a song that we were both super proud of. We yeah. made it like literally the first time we ever yeah. worked together. We started around like three or four in the afternoon. It was really relaxed. And then by like, yeah, like 4 a.m. Yeah, we so had like this that, completely like, finished song that we were yeah. like, oh my God, we just did this from scratch. Yeah, well, you obviously had to get back and do more of that. So she started returning back to Copenhagen more and more. You know, obviously I was doing my, my K-pop thing, which is I was, I was kind of already doing by the time I met Charlie. And then uh, my greatest idol, uh, Teddy Riley, you know, the guy I've been studying just for the longest time. So I was a kid, I just I mm -hmm. completely looked up to this guy. I got invited because he was also doing camps for SM. A lot of big American producers uh, do camps for SM all the time. And he was doing one for SM and I was invited by SM to join his camp, which I just thought was such an so honor. So crazy. And at the same time, I'd just begun working with Charlie. When I was there in the first camp, I was like, this isn't right that only I am here. I mean, she should also be here. They obviously didn't know about it yet, right? And I was like, this isn't right that she's not here. So. I, I went into Teddy's uh, Teddy's studio when you know when we'd done a few songs together, and I kind of you know felt it was it was appropriate to introduce him to something. I said, "Listen, there's this girl. I've got a few songs I can play you. This is not no bullshit. Like, check this out." And I think uh, halfway through the things about where the chorus starts, he was like, "Yeah, I want this girl." That's basically how we both got into K-pop. A little different, but then obviously our stories kind of coalesced at one point, and yeah. then we we carried on from there. So that's pretty much how it's. Wow, what yeah. a year. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. That's pretty insane. I can't help but wonder was Lips played at your wedding since it was the first I song that you wrote? Uh, a few first songs were played. Actually, I think, a few were. I, I think, think, think the, the Kim, the Kim Lips, the Eclipse, the Kim Lips song. <laughs> The was original version, Destiny. which was called Destiny, with Charlie's voice on it, was played at the wedding, actually. I don't think uh, oh. What Crazy Feels Like was played there, no, I don't but I, I okay. know that Jimbo, our, our good friend from from uh, from Korea, from from Seoul, Jimbo the Super Freak, just giving give a shout out to him. We love um, Jimbo. He DJed at our wedding. He DJed, and I think, as, you know, as a, you know, sort of an in-joke, he played one of Charlie's uh, actual demos that that went on to become Kim Lip's song. He yeah, played that played original the at the wedding. And then, and Charlie then he like was, passes me the mic. Yeah, and, I and then like... Charlie had to sing to it, like, you know, in, in a full wedding dress with like people around, you know, while we had the reception oh, in space. It was, it, was, it was super fun. It was a cool moment, man. It yeah. was cool. So That's cool. beautiful. That's so beautiful. Uh, Since you guys have been writing for the industry for eight, nine years and experiencing a ton of different songwriting camps, as you guys have just been talking about, how do you feel the K-pop industry and songwriting camps have changed since when you first started writing? When we started in the industry about nine years ago, camps were a pretty new thing for the K-pop industry. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So I think it had been obviously like an imported process they'd seen work um, in, with Western record labels. And it was, right. I, I believe it was quite new around the start of, of yeah. the, the last decade. So like around 2010, 2011, it was a pretty new thing. Yeah. So mm -hmm. I felt like there was a lot of emphasis on camps and there was a lot of energy that the, the Korean record labels had towards hosting camps because they could get all this mm. international talent to fly over. So, mm -hmm. it, you know, I know that they were having many, many, many camps yeah. during the year. Um, and I feel okay. like the last five or six years, they've kind of started to whittle down the amount of camps they have in the year that may, maybe made them more focused. Yeah. The first camps we did, 
there would maybe be like 12 to 15 writers yeah. at a camp and there would be 30 songs um, submitted yeah. for the camp. And that, you know, once once you keep doing that, there's an incredible backlog of material that they have to sift through right. and yeah. assign to different projects. So I feel yeah. like that over time, they kind of wanted to focus in a bit more on specific projects. Which there's some sense to that the too, the, Yeah, actually. the camps got smaller. Initially, the A&Rs would, would come down to the sessions a bit more and be like a bit more yeah. hands-on. And then, and then you know, over the last couple of years, because of the online situation, because of COVID, yeah. it's been a bit more remote. You know, we haven't been able to experience the, the face-to-face aspect with not being able to travel to Korea. So I, I feel like every songwriter is probably felt the you know yeah. the effects of that i mean if you're asking if the industry was changing in, in before covid i don't think it really mm-hmm. was in particular i think okay. i think what charlie was saying is true uh, even before covid if we if we take covid out of the picture for a second i think i think they were maybe cutting down on the amounts of camps that they were having because they were having just like an abundance just in quantity almost like right camps, yeah and even my first two camps uh, i don't think it was as many as 30 tracks but i think we did almost 20 just shy of 20 and it doesn't necessarily produce the quality that you want um and i found that out found that out as well so I, I started to cut down on the amount of writers i started to find out okay which specific writers can we do just about anything with we needed to be a smaller more contained team and then maybe a lower output of songs but stronger songs so some of those go on to become singles and maybe make more history and make more business or whatever just do do better and then of course COVID hit which just shut everything down uh obviously as we all know i'm hoping to see if by 2022 it'll get get back to face-to-face camps where people are there physical physical camps where, where we're all there uh, because it is quite different and it's organic, isn't it? You know, it's, 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 it's a really great process for us because yeah. we get to also hear, you know, we get to kind of tailor something very specific. Yeah. And that's obviously one of the benefits of being face to face that you don't get when it's remote. You kind of feel like it's a bit more of a shot in the dark. And yeah. for me, one of the, the, the more fun aspects of the songwriting camps in, in person was the listening session at the end of the week oh, yeah. where we basically listened to all the songs that were written by all the different you know writers in the different studios. Mm-hmm. And we could really get a sense of the body of work that was kind of major in the that week. The effect the songs are and having. It, it would feel really, it would be exciting and it'd be a way for writers to connect because yeah. if you necessarily hadn't worked with a writer but you heard their song on that night, you'd be like, wow, we should we should link up because yeah. what, what you uh, did really worked for me. And yeah. it was like a really great networker. Yeah. With the remote sessions, that's not possible anymore. So I no. think I think that's kind of a shame. Wow. Well, changing topics to some of the tracks, uh, instrumentals that I have fun listening to, Time Slip and Perfect Ten. There are so many different sound effects like the the <laughs> and cowbell and Time Slip and the different voices saying Ten in Perfect Ten. So I was wondering, oh, yeah. how often do you take sounds from libraries versus recording your own voice and putting effects on it? Uh, the Ten, and I'll start with Perfect Ten. I, I, I love that instrumental, by the way. It was one of my favorites. It, it was called uh, Sex Tape first. Because I sometimes name Ooh. Yeah, but it, it was awesome. but I have to name the instrumental something so we can remember what it is. The uh, 10 was my suggestion. It was like a Mac text to speech. So you it, speak and, into the Mac and, and it, then, it speaks back. Yeah, and then we picked yeah. different ones because they have names. They have like Roger and Robert and you know, whatever. So it's like Siri. Yeah, and then yeah, yeah. there's like a list of names. They just give them names, these voices, and you can just. So I had Robert or whatever it was. I kept or Joe or. It was whatever. like male and female yeah. ones, and you could like audition the sound just right. to get the one you want. So I picked a few of the males and just had them all say ten turn turn ten turn like different kinds of ten. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then we slotted slotted that in, and I think some some of the other sound effects that you might be referring to, which because I'm not sure they they would have been added by D's because D's did a lot of okay. construction yeah. on it, and and, and childish was Jimbo. And on childish, the track was was Time's was left. mine. Yes, okay. sorry. Childish initially. Yes, yeah. yes. Sorry, yeah. we have to refer to it as the thing that came out. Yeah. It came out as Time, time slip. slip. And Jimbo, the super freak, our friend that we talked about earlier, who, who also DJ at a wedding, uh, he he uh, also he was on that camp and he also produces as well. And I used to also give the, the, the producers and writers that I would give the track to freedom to add a few elements if they heard and they felt that it needed you know some something else like a little extra so so i think this these are effects that that jimbo just went ahead and added you know so i think that might have been him you have a few sound effects that you'll use you probably know more than i do yeah, i'm actually. too close to it like i don't even i don't he doesn't really like, notice when you just do it you <laughs> i just do it I, I just do it do I, i've seen him add maybe you should answer that question he's got, he's got a few few like really signature ones there's like a sound of like ticking clocks Oh yeah, that in the and it's in, like a certain and he would use that on yeah. a few songs that's like right. t- like, like a 
few really cool like textures that he uses and stuff, but it's probably hard for you to see what they it, are. It is because I don't because remember because I just do it and, and I don't remember. Yeah. Mm, but, yeah. But in those particular two songs, it was a track I had given uh, uh, D's, but I think that particular, the turn, turn the voices work, was something I suggested that we do. That is <laughs> so fun. Yeah, yeah. Oh my goodness. Another track that is super fun to listen to is Look. I'm curious, how does one come up with the idea to start off a song with all those trapped and affected vocals? And ba, ba, once again, ba, 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 and yeah, once again this, was, this was a track that I, Charlie and I designed this 80s sounding track, yeah. a very like 80s R&B track in, in LA. And we brought the track with us to, uh, to the next camp. And uh, okay. Jimbo the Super Freak and, uh, okay. and Suman, his writing partner, those uh -huh. two went into a room with the track and they added those that was yeah. Suman's voice and yeah. they, they, they the did something. Jimbo's a really outside the box type And writer. so is Suman, they're Again, very original. Suman's very, very yeah. quirky, different. She has yeah. a complete unique sound for her own. So when we put those two together, they had like, an, a, like a really interesting way of, of, of working on that track. And they came up with like a, what felt it was like a Madonna inspired, like a really yeah. cool right. top line. That it, had, it got like a Madonna feel, like that's Mad right. Like Madonna feel, which was so cool. Yeah. And it, very different and very, like not what we would have done necessarily, no. but no. really, really cool for it. So that was actually their idea to do the chops. Right. Speaking of a uh, mysterious cut, uh, I topic I sent some SM stands are hoping that I bring up is Boom Chicka, the track we heard a bit of yes. in the BBC <laughs> K-pop documentary. Yes. Is that yes. something you're allowed to talk about? <laughs> Um, I would, I would say yeah. uh, we're not not allowed to talk about it. Um, okay. <laughs> That track is actually one of our was one of our favorites from the last camp we did. Yeah. Mr. Suman Lee came down to the studio right. as yeah. as sh was shown in the BBC documentary. We'd finished the track pretty much that day. Yeah. It was Kenzie, Andreas Oberg, Obi, and myself that wrote the song. Um, the only team I would have done that with because we had about seven hours to be finished with a thing and Suman oh Lee, we'd God. never met before, who basically. Oh. Did, credited with starting all of k-pop basically so we had a bit of a yeah. Yeah, it was a lot situation. of pressure and he had to come down and we had to basically play him this thing and it better be good <laughs> so it was it was so the boom chica song this is set yeah, yeah, yeah. straight it is a full song it's yeah. not just the snippet that's on there yeah and the song hopefully we're very hopeful that the song will be released yeah. soon on one of red velvet's i guess upcoming yeah. projects yeah that's who we intended the song for we know just as much as you guys do as, as you know in regards to when yeah. it's going to be released but we're we we're really excited about the song yeah it turned out really great and it was a really great fit for fingers crossed for red velvet so yeah yeah we're just gonna wait and see kind of and then hopefully you know within the next year or so the song will be out and then everybody will get to hear the full thing yeah okay yeah then, that's why i called it mysterious because everyone's like when is it gonna be released it's meant for red velvet right when ah and you know yeah. all okay, they have to the plan together like they know when they want to release yeah. things so we just trust that they they kind of have an overview and a sense of when it's going to come out so we don't you know we're no. just going to wait and see yeah, I've, I've heard from Andreas, one of his songs was held for four years before it was released, so. Yeah, well, pretty much. Just happened. Yeah. Meeting uh, Isuman is like one of the ultimate things to happen, I'm guessing, in, in like your K-pop <laughs> producing yeah, career. We, yeah, we do have a lot of tremendous, a lot of respect for him. Uh, I've briefly encountered him once in an elevator, but that wasn't really a meeting, so I, I just seen him. <laughs> in the corner, like. like once. <laughs> logical figure you know who, who basically started this whole sweeping uh this gigantic wave of uh, you know this new trend called yeah. k-pop and but he was uh he was extremely pleasant yeah that's wonderful on on top of meeting isuman i've heard that in your past interviews you've mentioned that you've been able to meet artists you've written for like red velvet exo and super junior so something i think fans would find interesting is what kind of situations do you get to meet them in? do they like pop in while during a songwriting camp or do you meet them backstage after a concert um i I was in a camp with a um, uh, now uh, late uh, member of um, Shiny. Shiny. I was in a session with him during the Teddy Riley camp, which is the only time I, I can think that I've been in a session, okay. unless I'm wrong. Okay. With Boa, actually. Oh, Boa, too. We've, oh, actually, so, we've too. actually written with Boa That's in the true. room as That's well. That's true. Otherwise, yeah. they are a bit like what you said. The situations are more or less, they come down sometimes, and not always, at the end of a camp. I might sit in for a song or two. Uh, I think I encountered Shiny, the same guy, twice. Once was in a, a, a session with Teddy Riley, uh, where him and I sat in top line to the song together. We had uh, an A&R uh, from, from SM translate 
the whole session. Okay, you did have a translator. Uh, and so, you know, that was that was a very interesting process, but we managed to get through the song and I think he was going to sing the whole thing in Korean. So he was doing some translation at the time. So I was helping with melodies, but he was going to sing Korean words to it. So wow. we definitely needed, a, a, you know, mm, an, a, 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 yeah, somebody to, to mediate that. Mm. And and then like, like Charlie said, there was another time many years on where we worked with Boa in the room as mm -hmm. well for one of the songs. I don't think that song came out. I think the song with, with uh, say his name again. Jung Hyun. Yes, that, that, that song actually came out. Other than that, they mostly come down and, and sometimes hear a song. Like when we did Lo Siento, we had done one version of it, which is not the version that ended up uh, coming out. We've done a very early camp version. I think they had Shaini come down and uh, this, this, this fellow- Right, because it was originally meant for them. Yes, this they, fellow- They previewed was, the song um, yeah. in the listening session. So they, sometimes the artists will drop in just yeah. to kind of hear the finish. If, they, if the A&Rs kind of tip them off and said, there's a song that we think will be great for you guys. Sometimes if they're in the building or they're close by, they pop in. Because the, the area where the studio is in, in, um, in, in Gangnam, yeah. in Seoul, um, I think a lot of the artists live not far from the studio. So mm -hmm. sometimes they, they, you know, they call in now and again, if they have a recording session upstairs or whatever, they, they pop by. So there's been yeah. a few instances where they've actually been present to hear the songs. Yeah. But for the most part, they're, they're quite removed from the process. Yeah. It's just usually the songwriters and the A&Rs. And then after we fly back to Europe, they um, they record the songs yeah. at a later point. Yeah. yeah, I was surprised. And that song actually, I think that year, Billboard chose that song as one of their favorite K-pop songs of the year. I remember that. Which was super cool. Congrats to my wife. I had actually nothing to do with that song. <laughs>